What's going on guys, Justin here and welcome to our fifth number theory example video. Now today's video is going to center around modular arithmetic and I'm actually going to be joined by Michael who's going to do the first example. So let me pitch that to him now. Okay, so let's first prove that congruence mod n is an equivalence relation. That means there's three things to check. We've got to check that it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Okay, so let's start by showing that it's reflexive. So that means what we want is for all integers a, a is congruent to a modulo n. But actually that's fairly quick. That's because n divides zero. n divides zero because zero can be written as zero times n. But since zero, n divides zero, that means n divides a minus a. But that's exactly the condition for a to be congruent to a mod n, which is what we want. Okay, so the next thing that we need to prove is that this is symmetric. So that means we need to show that a is congruent to b mod n implies that b is congruent to a mod n. So let's do that. So let's suppose that a is congruent to b mod n, but that tells us that n divides b minus a, but that means that b minus a equals n times k for some integer k. But that means that a minus b is equal to n times minus k, just multiplying both sides of this equation by minus 1. But since k is an integer right there, let's say k is an integer, then negative k is also an integer, meaning that we have a divisibility relationship n divides a minus b, but that's exactly the condition for b to be congruent to a mod n. And I'd like to point out here that this step from here to here by the definition of congruence mod n really kind of varies from textbook to test textbook whether or not you start with n divides b minus a from this definition or n divides a minus b from this definition. Um, and that's because this is a symmetric thing, so it doesn't really matter which way you do it. Okay, so now let's move on to transitive. So to prove that this is transitive, we first need to suppose that a is congruent to b mod n and that b is congruent to c mod n, and then end with a is congruent to c mod n. Okay, so let's unravel these using definitions. This means that n divides b minus a, and n divides c minus b. But that means that b minus a equals n times k, and c minus b equals n times l. And here k and l are appropriate integers to make this work. So where would we go from here? Well, I think it's pretty clear that we would just add these two equations. If we add these two equations, the b's cancel, and we get c minus a is equal to n times k plus l. And since k and l are integers, k plus l is an integer, meaning this tells us that n divides c minus a, which is ex exactly the condition for a to be congruent to c modulo n, which finishes this transitivity proof. All right, for our second example, we are going to be finding the least non-negative integer congruent to each of these. So we have 7 to the 43rd mod 11, 6 to the 25th mod 11, and 6 to the 25th mod 12. So for part A, we have 7 to the 43rd, and we want to reduce mod 11. So usually when I start with uh, these types of uh, mod reduction problems, I like to look at the first few powers of our base to see if we have kind of an easy reduction so we can re reduce our total number of powers that we're dealing with. So checking the first two powers of 7, I found very quickly that 7 cubed is 343. And 343 is just 2 more than a power of 11, 341. We can rewrite 7 to the 43rd as 14 copies of 7 cubed, which is congruent to 2, times 1 extra 7. So we're going to write that there. We're going to have 2 to the 14th times 7, because each of those 7 cubes is congruent to 2. So how do we reduce that further? Well... 
2 to the 5th is equal to 32, which is negative 1 mod 11, as it is 1 less than 33, which means that we can reduce that 2 to the 14 even more to give us negative 1 times negative 1, which is just 1, times 2 to the 4th times 7. And 2 to the 4th is 16, which reduces to 5 mod 11, which gives us 5 times 7, and 35 is obviously congruent to 2 mod 11, so that's going to complete that first part. So for part B, we have 6 to the 25th mod 11. So for this one, I broke it up into 2 to the 25th power times 3 to the 25th power because I thought that reducing the 2 and the 3 separately would be easier than reducing 6. So because we already did our first problem, I decided to split up this 6 to the 25th into 2 to the 25th and 3 to the 25th, and that's because we already know that 2 to the 5th is congruent to negative 1 mod 11. So writing, two, uh, writing 6 to the 25th as 2 to the 25th times 3 to the 25th allows us to cancel out all of our two terms because we can write it as negative negative one to the fifth power or just one negative one. Uh, next, we need to figure out how to cancel out our um, powers of three, but um, it's a pretty simple calculation to see that three to the fifth is going to be congruent to one mod 11, which means that we can cancel out all of our three to the fifths. And that leaves us simply with negative one mod 11 and negative one mod 11 is congruent to 10 mod 11. So that finishes that one off. So part C is actually really easy as we have a power of six reduced mod 12. We know that uh, six squared is 36, which is obviously zero mod 12. That allows us to rewrite six to the 25th as zero to the 12th power times six. Well, obviously if you take six times something that reduces to zero, we're gonna get zero. So that means we can write that as zero mod 12 and that finishes off all of number two. All right, for number three, we wanna show that if A is congruent to B mod N, then A cubed is congruent to B cubed mod N. Now, as we know from our definition of congruence mod, we can rewrite A congruent to B mod N as X times N is equal to A minus B. So we're gonna rearrange that by moving the B over and we will have that A is equal to X N minus B. Next, we're going to cube both sides, so that will give us a cubed equal to xn minus b quantity cubed, and we're going to multiply that out, which will give us a cubed is equal to xn quantity cubed plus 3b times xn quantity squared plus 3b squared times xn plus b cubed, and next we're going to subtract that b cubed over to the left side because that's where we want it, and we're going to factor out an n from the rest of that polynomial. That gives us a cubed minus b cubed is equal to n times some stuff, but that means obviously that n divides a cubed minus b cubed, so using our definition of congruence mod, we can write that as a cubed is congruent to b cubed mod n, which finishes that one off. For our fourth problem, this one is actually very easy. We want to find all n such that 27 is congruent to 5 mod n. Well, just like we used on the last one, we're going to use our definition of congruence mod. And that means we can write that n divides 27 minus 5. Well, what's 27 minus 5? That is 22. So what are all the possibilities for n dividing 22? Well, that gives us possibilities for n that are 1, 2, 11, and 22. And those are all the possibilities. So that finishes this one off right away. For number 5, we're going to try to find the possible last digits of perfect squares. We're going to do this by writing out an expression for all natural numbers so that we have for a non-negative integer k, we can say that all natural numbers are of the form 10k, 10k plus or minus one, 10k plus or minus two, 10k plus or minus three, 10k plus or minus four, and 10k plus five. Now from here, we can square each of these cases and then reduce mod 10 to find out the last digit. So it's very easy to see that for numbers of the form 10k, if we square them and reduce mod five, we're going to get zero for numbers of the form 10k plus or minus 1, we're going to get 1. For 10k plus or minus 2, we'll get 4. For 10k plus or minus 3, we'll get 9. For 10k plus or minus 4, we'll get 6. And for 10k plus 5, we will get 5. And that checks all possibilities for our natural numbers. So our possible last digits for perfect squares are 0, 1, 4, 9, 6, and 5. And that's all for this video, and that's a good place to stop.